Welcome to Melrose Unitarian Universalist Church. Our service today is called. I changed it at the last minute and I didn't put it in here, but it's, <laughs> uh, it's called something like, what can we learn from the octopus? Vulnerability. Um, we're gonna explore all of those things, so maybe we'll let the title slide come up and tell us what the title is. There we go. Lay down your armor, learning about vulnerability from the octopus. Took a few tries, but we got there eventually. So, good morning. Good morning. I am the Reverend Dr. Suzanne Intrilligator. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the minister of this congregation, and I am still floating on a cloud from the marvelous, wonderful event we had last night, our annual auction, the first time in three years that we were together in person and had a great party. And here to tell us about the final results of all that, all the things we accomplished, is the auction team chair, Alex Leach. I think it's on. Can you, is this mic on over there? Thanks, Bill. Okay. Good morning, everyone. You can pull it up a little bit. There you go. There we go. Another thing. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Alex Leach. I was the chair of the auction committee this year. Um, so first I just want <laughs> um, so first I just want to say thank you um, to everybody who attended our live auction event last night. It was a really great success. It was really fun. Um, and also thank everybody who donated items, um, both to the live auction and to the silent auction, and everybody who bid. Um, and also, before I get to the uh, grand total that we raised last night, I just want to say um, Wendy Masternardi is here, um, and uh, some people still owe um, some money for random things <laughs> related to the auction. So um, if you owe any money, you can certainly talk to her about that. Um, so, without any further ado, um, we've tallied everything up, um, and it came to a grand total of $14,000. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Congratulations. Tom, give us a few bars of we're in the money. Was that your, we're in the money? Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Just for the folks on Zoom, that was Wendy Mastronardi saying they're already recruiting for the auction team next year. Thank you, and congratulations once again. Fabulous night. Um, just a few other announcements. I want to remind everybody that our memorial service for our beloved member, Margaret Gromitstein, is this coming Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, next Sunday, we start the annual pledge drive. So it's a big Sunday. We call it Giving Sunday, and I hope that everyone can come and be here together on this really important Sunday. Um, at the end of the month, we have Music Sunday coming up on March 26th. The choir is already getting ready, and I'm looking forward to it, so that's exciting too. And I just want to mention that today we continue to adjust the look and feel of our slides in the worship show to make sure that they are as accessible as they can be for people with visual impairments. If you have any feedback or comments about that, I hope you'll come and talk to me in the parlor after the worship service today. And one last quick announcement from the captain of our anti-racism team. It's Josh Shortledge here to tell us about an important anti-racism class that's coming up. So we have an important, uh, no, excuse me, I'm starting a little early. Our church is co-sponsoring an anti-racism class with the Fallen Church and the First Parish of Lexington. And we're also inviting other north of Boston UU churches to join, including UU Urban Ministry, Medford, Malden, Reading, Wakefield, Arlington, Winchester, Swampscott congregations. We have an important one question survey in the midweek update that is beckoning you over the next few weeks. 
Maybe some of you clicked on it on this week's midweek update. However, the survey link did not quite work yet. So if any of you clicked on it, it didn't work yet. However, that survey link is not quite working yet. Hopefully this next week the link will work and a pull down menu will magically appear at the top that allows you to answer the question and submit it to us. <clears throat> okay. The course is named Jubilee 3 and will run in person and hybrid on, all of, on the fall weekend of October 20th through 22nd. So it's not this church here, it's next church here in the fall, October 20 to 22nd. We encourage taking the class here in the sanctuary, although you can also take any portion of the class over Zoom or from other churches in the North Shore. <clears throat> Our goal is to nurture MUUC and other UU churches to become more welcoming multiculturally. So rather than Sunday mornings being the most segregated time of the week, Let's change our churches. When the pull down menu does work, please answer the single question, even if your answer is no, I don't want to attend. We need to get a metric of how many people are interested in participating. We really appreciate your help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And a quick thank you to our helpers today. We've ushered Nyla McCullough, the greeter Nancy Nichols, and thank you again to our coffee host, David Bliss and Jeannie Harris. Thanks for your help. Now, it's our moment to have a quick look around and greet each other this morning. Turn around in the pew, say hello, wave. Let's see our folks at home on Zoom. We can say hello to them up here on the screen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I see some enthusiastic waving. Hello. Hi. Welcome to worship. I call us to worship this morning with these words on our theme of vulnerability. They're written by the Reverend Scott Taylor. This morning, we remember those who convinced us that it was safe to share our thoughts, those who proved that not everyone will run from the weight of the pain we carry, those who held us in our fear and helped us heal from our regret, those whose humble apologies made us believe that we too could be forgiven. And those whose tenderness helped us see that we no longer need to hide. Our vulnerability frees us. It binds us. It makes holy the path we travel together. May we ever keep that in our view. And now together, let us light the symbol of our living faith, the flaming chalice, here to light it for us this morning and lead us in our covenant are newer members, Lisa Wilson-Wright and John Wright. In body or in spirit, and join me in the words of our covenant, which you can see on the screen. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind and fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. This is our great covenant, one with another and with our God. Remain standing. And if you would, please join the choir and me for our opening hymn, which is number 123 in the gray hymnal, Spirit of Life.
As Reverend Suzanne has said, our theme this month is vulnerability. But can anyone tell me what vulnerability is? Does anybody know? No one? Dan? Yes, that is a great example of vulnerability, speaking out in the service. And it's when we open ourselves up in a way where we risk being hurt. If we raise our hand in the service and we get the answer wrong, we might feel really embarrassed, right? So life asks us to be vulnerable in a lot of ways. And today we're going to talk about four. So let's see what I have in my bag. First is a frog. Frogs are known for jumping and leaping. And there's a phrase about leaping that connects to vulnerability. A leap of faith. Yeah, that's right, Ethan. Thinking about when a frog leaps, they are trusting that they will land on solid and safe ground, hoping that they don't miss the log they are trying to jump to. One of the biggest leaps of faith we can make has to do with making new friends. When we approach a potential new friend, we are taking a leap of faith that the person will like us back and respond kindly. It can make us feel nervous to approach someone new and say, I like you. Second is a worry stone. Everyone has worries and anxiety. Some of us have more, some of us have less. Worry stones are something that people use to tell their worries to. They may keep it in a pocket to use as something to hold on to when their worry starts to overwhelm them. Being worried and anxious can make us feel really alone. And sharing our worries can help us feel more calm. In those moments, life is asking us to be vulnerable and to say to someone we trust, I need help. Third is a feather. Birds can be a symbol of hope, and there is a poem by Unitarian poet, Emily Dickinson, that says, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Hope is a vulnerable thing. When we hope, we are trusting that something will happen when there is no guarantee that it will. Hope can come with disappointment, but hope is also what enables us to escape hard times. Because when we hope, we keep our eyes open and when we keep our eyes open, we are able to notice the way forward. We continue to hope because we know magic things happen when we vulnerably take that risk and say to ourselves, I trust it will happen. Fourth is a mask. Superheroes wear masks to keep their identities hidden and sometimes we might be wearing a mask when we want to pretend to be someone or something other than who we really are. Another way of thinking about masks is that sometimes we pretend to be someone else without an outside mask, just so we aren't taking any risks of being different. We pretend to like things our friends like even though we don't, we pretend to be someone different than who we truly are on the inside because we don't feel comfortable or safe. It can take a lot of bravery and vulnerability to take that mask off, to stop pretending and say, this is me. And I know that I have had to be vulnerable in all these ways before. So when I hear these phrases, I feel them. I can remember how it feels to be vulnerable in that way. So now I'm going to repeat the phrases, and I want you to think of having to say them to someone else and pay attention to how you feel. I 
like you. I need help. I trust it will happen. This is me. How did they feel? Which one did you feel the strongest? Now please turn to a neighbor and share a little of what came up for you. And folks on Zoom can share with each other in the chat box. Thank you all for taking the time to share with each other and for listening to each other. Our children can now leave for RE. Thank you. Thanks. Every Sunday at the center of our service, we make space for quiet contemplation. So now I ask each of us to enter into that time together, make it a time when we can connect to our inner selves, our higher, our higher selves, our ideas of the holy or the divine, however it is we understand that. So I ask you to first get in touch with your body, feel it relax into the pew, Feel your feet on the floor. Take a deep breath. In this meditation time together, first we'll join in our centering song. Then we'll have a few minutes of shared quiet. Then we'll speak to one another of our joys and sorrows. And I will lead us in a meditation. Our worship themes for March are vulnerability and our seventh UUA principle, which is respect for the interdependent web of all existence. Like spider silk, our bonds to one another and to all living things are strong, yet delicate, flexible, yet fragile. Let us hold them with care. Our centering song for the month of March is number 15 in the gray hymnal, The Lone Wild Bird. 
Lyrics will appear on the screen. Remain seated, join in as you like. Let the song gently guide you into our time of quiet. It is our tradition in our worship service to share with one another the joys and sorrows of our lives, the personal milestones that we pass in this journey we share. So I invite anyone who has a sorrow they would like to share with us this morning to come forward and speak from the mic so that everyone can hear you and see you. And I invite the people on Zoom to um, type it theirs into the chat box and I will read them aloud.
Doesn't seem to be working. Let's yes. try that. Uh, my name is Mary Delahanty. Um, this is a candle of concern for my father-in-law. Um, he's been in long-term care for about a year and a half now, and last weekend he had a fall. And we got a call at 2 o'clock in the morning to say, you know, what are we supposed to do? And he's basically on some pretty heavy-duty pain meds. Um, and right now he's really feeling discouraged because of his lack of mobility. And we're really just kind of on standby, you know, one day at a time. So concern for him. Thank you, Mary. And here I have made a mistake. I'm trying to do the service today from my iPad, but the Zoom is on my laptop. So I'm going to walk over there and see if we have any sorrows from our Zoom people. Thank you, Bill, for trying to follow me around, and I'm making your life difficult, and I apologize. Uh, from Dan Franklin. Oh, uh, a candle of concern for my biopsy, which was rescheduled for tomorrow morning, hoping for good news. And now I invite anyone who has a, oh, excuse me, before we do that, can we please? Nyla, I'm making one mistake after the other. I must have been out last night at the auction. If you would please light a candle to show our caring and concern for the sorrow that was shared this morning, the sorrows that were shared this morning, and all the sorrows that we carry in our hearts unspoken this morning. Let it be a reminder to us to reach out to one another with care and concern. And now I invite people, if they have a joy to share, to please come forward to speak from the microphone, or people in Zoom, please go ahead and type into the chat box. Good morning. My name is Don Bissex, and today, March 5th, is my Janice and ours 35th wedding anniversary. Chuck Foley, uh, update from last week. My hand surgery last Monday was successful. That's wonderful. Hi, Garen Boyd. Um, just celebrating, uh, two weeks ago I was reappointed on the Commission on Disability for another three years in the city of Melrose. Um, first term, I really, the whole commission was getting its legs and it was my first time in government, had no idea what we were doing, but this year starting out, we've got the report at the, behind us and we're ready to move forward and we're looking to make this city more accessible. Thank you for your service, Karen. Hi, I'm Corey Mann, and this is a candle of joy for my uh, son, Ian, who is a senior in high school and in a the theater troupe that, and uh, you may have heard of competitive theater, where they do blocks of five or six theater troops get together. They have to do a performance within 40 minutes maximum. And so they have to set it up quickly. They've got to act the whole thing. They've got to take it all down. It all gets judged. So that's what they're doing today down in Attleboro. And I'm wishing them luck to move on to the semifinals. That's lovely. And we don't, I don't see any joys in the Zoom room. There's lots of discussion about if there was a problem with sound or if we like the style of the slides. But I think. Oh, Dan says, great news, Chuck. So people are participating in joys and sorrows. Nyla, if you would please go ahead and light the other candle as a celebration of our many joys and as a reminder to all of us uh, to feel and know our gratitude for the many blessings in our lives. Thank you to everyone who shared today. Your sharing helps to weave us together as an ever stronger community.
I have a meditation this morning from the Reverend Richard S. Gilbert. Be gentle with one another. It's a cry from the lives of people battered by thoughtless words and brutal deeds. It comes from the lips of those who spoke them and the lives of those who do them. Who of us can look us inside another and know what is there of hope and hurt, of promise and pain? Who can know from what far places each has come or to what far places each may hope to go? Our lives are like fragile eggs. They crack and the substance escapes. Handle with care. Handle with exceedingly tender care. For there are human beings within, human beings as vulnerable as we are, who feel as we feel, who hurt as we hurt. Life is too transient to be cruel with one another. It is too short for thoughtlessness. It is too brief for hurting. It is long enough for a noisy, noisy furnace in the basement, just kicking in right now. Life is too transient to be cruel with one another. It is too short for thoughtlessness, too brief for hurting. Life is long enough for caring. It is lasting enough for sharing precious enough for love. Be gentle with one another. This church is a self-supporting organization funded by your generous annual pledge. You may also contribute to our weekly collection plate, which we split every month with a deserving cause. Folks on Zoom can donate either way using the orange button at the top right corner of our homepage at melroseuu.org. For the month of March, when we traditionally celebrate Music Sunday, this year on March 26th, the choir has chosen our Giving Beyond Walls recipient as a music-oriented Melrose nonprofit, the Opening Doors Project. We are proud to share half of our collection plate this month with this new organization which grew out of this church and which seeks to amplify voices of color and advance conversations about race through the arts. Our offertory music selection today poignantly expresses our March theme of vulnerability. The choir will sing, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child.
Thank you, choir. Our reading today is a poem by William Arthur Ward. He was a motivational writer from Texas who was published regularly in the 1960s in Reader's Digest and in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. This is a poem called To Risk. To laugh is to risk appearing the fool, to weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing your true self. To place your ideas and dreams before a crowd is to risk their loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure, but risks must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. Once upon a time, very long ago, I was in the ninth grade and graduating from junior high. We were all way too excited about something we called the ninth grade prom. It was held in a rented VFW type hall about uh, a mile from school, a really just an empty room with a dance floor and just a few chairs lining the edges of it and we got all dressed up. The boys wore jackets and ties they had borrowed from their fathers and their big brothers, and the girls wore dresses and maybe for the first time ever, makeup and heels. It was a rite of passage, and that evening, of course, is emblazoned in my mind because it was a roller coaster of, you know, hormone-fueled emotions. The DJ, of course, played, as they usually do, three fast songs and then a slow song. And then the slow song, back then, people didn't, well, at least where I lived, people didn't really dance much to the fast songs, especially in junior high. We sort of separated from one another in packs and stared at each other across the room. Uh, so all of it was leading up to the big moment at the very end, the last slow dance of the evening. And at that point, no one had yet asked me to dance, so I had been able to grab one of those few chairs. And every single time there had been a slow dance, I was able to move to another vacant chair. And by the end of the evening, I had the best chair in the room, right smack in the middle of the popular crowd of cool kids. It was primo. But then at that big moment, just at the start of the last slow song of the evening, a boy named Larry 
that I had secretly been crushing on since the fifth grade, a tall, quiet, shy kid who didn't ever talk but was on the football team, so of course was by default very popular and cool. Well, he, from across the room, walked toward me and split the popular kids like the Red Sea, and everybody turned to follow him and watch what he would do. And he walked up to me, looks down at me, very loud for everyone to hear, Sue, because everybody called me Sue then, would you like to dance with me? Well, oh my God, I was just stunned. I had never even spoken to him before. Did someone tell him about my crush? Oh my God, oh my God, maybe he liked me back. Well, I gathered my courage and I stood up. Yes. Long pause. So, he said, and he sat in my chair. It was supposed to be a funny story, you guys. <laughs> it's funny to me now. My family thinks of it as a funny story. Yes, so he did all that just to take my chair because he wanted the best chair in the room. Yeah, and I felt like everybody, the whole world, had turned to stare at me and laugh. It was... Um, yeah, it was a moment to remember in my life. Vulnerability. When you hear that word, what comes to your mind? Do you have a memory like that from long ago? A moment when it felt like the whole world was looking at you and laughing? Ouch. No wonder we hate vulnerability. <laughs> we don't want to talk about it, and I sure did not want to do it as a worship topic. But I guess I must have missed that email about the moment when all the ministers in the Soul Matters sharing circle voted on what the themes were going to be this year. See, it pays to read your email, and I miss them too. So, how do we handle this worship theme? How do we talk to one another about our mistakes, about our grief, our tender humanness, without having to spill the beans or overshare or tell one another our most embarrassing stories from junior high. I mean, is that really necessary? I was pondering all this and trying to figure out what to do this month when another minister happened to mention to me the octopus, and it captured my attention. Did you know that octopuses, octopi, I suppose, have three hearts? They can taste with their skin. They can feel light. They can hear impeccably, although they don't have ears. Each octopus has nine brains. Nine, the main one in their head, but they also have eight others throughout their bodies. And those brains can make separate decisions. It's true. Two-thirds of their intelligence is spread out through their bodies in these eight other brains. The octopus's cousin, the mollusk, has a brain with about 20,000 neurons. But the octopus's brain contains 500 million neurons. It's about as complex as a dog's brain. The octopus is widely considered the most intelligent of all the invertebrate animals. In captivity, octopuses have been known to solve complex puzzles. They can open jars, even baby-proofed jars. At one zoo, an octopus escaped down a drain pipe and found its way all the way back to the ocean. At an aquarium, they figured out that one octopus had been escaping from its tank every single night and going into other tanks to hunt fish. And it went on for months before they figured it out. Why are octopuses so intelligent? Well, one theory goes that this animal evolved so dramatically because of its vulnerability. Unlike the turtle, who is protected by its hard shell and has not changed at hardly at all across all eons, the, the octopus has no protection at all. It's just a soft, vulnerable little body open to a sea full of predators. So instead, the octopus evolved at lightning speed, comparatively speaking. It developed a complex three-layer system of camouflage that allows it to blend in immediately with its environment, changing its shape, its color, and its texture at will. 
while a chameleon can take up to 20 seconds to change its color, an octopus can do it in milliseconds. And the octopus can also change its texture. It can get craggy and bumpy to look like the coral. And it can shape shift. So when it's chased, it can fit into cracks or crevices that are hardly like a millimeter bigger than its eyeball. It's a profoundly successful animal. There are 300 different species of octopuses living in hugely divergent, diverse habitats all around the world. What can we learn from this animal? The writer Andrea Gibson had this powerful reflection. I'll give you just a small excerpt. Quote, one could spend a lifetime complimenting the octopus's history of turning vulnerability into a powerful source of growth. At the same time, there are a myriad of ways that humans are not evolving as a species because of our protective shells. Many of us are guarded, closed, shut down. But it's impossible to learn in a state of defensiveness. What might we grow into if we allowed ourselves to be softer, more open, more exposed, more transparent about the truth inside of us? How might we evolve if we let our guard down? If we, like the octopus, knew that what makes us soft is what makes us strong, how would the world be different? Unquote. I have another true story for you. Thankfully, this one is not about me. The South African filmmaker, Craig Foster, was burned out. In middle age, he lost his passion for his work. He was lethargic and listless, unmoored, depressed. Then a memory came to him. 20 years earlier, he had worked on a film about indigenous African cultures, and he'd met, working on that, he'd met some trackers men who could find animals in the wild by following clues that were invisible to everyone else. Craig Foster remembered that he had admired how they seemed totally immersed in nature, and he wanted that kind of experience for himself. Foster had grown up free diving in the ocean, exploring the underwater kelp forests off the western cape of South Africa. And now, in midlife, some instinct told him to return there, to go diving once again, every day, for a whole year. But this time, he needed to do it vulnerably, alone, with no wetsuit and no oxygen tank, just an eye mask, shorts, and flippers, popping back to the surface to breathe only when necessary. Vulnerable, dangerous, immersive, a few days into this practice, Craig meets an octopus, and he is entranced by her. This is the story behind the Netflix documentary film, My Octopus Teacher, which won the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 2020. If you've seen it, you know. If you haven't, you should. It's stunning and gorgeous and emotionally gripping. Something inside Craig makes him decide to go back and see the octopus every single day, to hold a vigil near her den, just to see what might happen. And slowly, across the days, somehow the octopus learns to trust him. She gets curious about him. She reaches out a tentacle and touches his hand. Soon she's swimming against his chest, and they're playing together in the ocean. Craig watches her hunt and feed. He watches the sharks circling around her. He documents with reverence the amazing capacities she holds for transformation, escape, evasion. Over time, as their bond grows, you can see Craig coming alive again, rebounding from his burnout, reawakening to life and to beauty and to joy. His vulnerability, her vulnerability, they build a bridge across vast differences of phylogeny. Of course, these days, it's almost impossible to talk about vulnerability without at least mentioning the researcher Brene Brown. And really, why would you not? 
Brown exploded into popular culture back in 2011, which is 12 years ago now, with her TED Talk on vulnerability. In it, she lays out what six years of qualitative research, thousands of stories told in hundreds of interviews had made clear to her. Connection is what gives our lives wholeness and meaning, and the path to connection is paved by vulnerability. That is how we connect, by allowing one another to see us, our humanness, our brokenness, our perfect imperfection. And she knows, and including her too, vulnerability scares us. Of course it does. We don't want to be exposed. Vulnerability scares us, and so we numb ourselves with TV, food, shopping, alcohol, drugs. Brene Brown says, we are the most in debt, obese, addicted, medicated, adult cohort in history. But she points out, you cannot selectively numb emotions. It's an all or nothing game. If you numb the bad feelings, fear and shame and vulnerability, you also numb the good feelings, happiness, joy, gratitude. And then of course, without joy in our lives, we feel miserable. We get depressed, we go looking for purpose and meaning, we realize we have to feel vulnerable, and so, says Brene, we feel like we have to go have a couple of beers and a banana muffin. <laughs> and it starts all over again. To get out of this cycle of numbing, she says, you have to learn how to embrace vulnerability. But it's not the vulnerability that's excruciating. There is no need to tell everybody your most embarrassing stories from junior high. It's not useful, Suzanne. That is called oversharing. What is useful, what matters, what breaks the cycle of numbing and leads us to live wholeheartedly is to cultivate a sense of worthiness, to teach yourself every day that you are worthy of love and belonging so that you don't need a hard shell of protection and perfectionism. Then you can learn to let yourself be soft with people you trust. And when things get tricky, that's the, bit, the hard part, you have to be aware of your armor, your desire to put up your defenses again. Brene Brown puts it this way, when you are in uncertainty, when you feel at risk, when you feel exposed, don't tap out. That's when you most need to stay brave, stay uncomfortable, stay in the cringy moment, and lean into the hard conversation. Vulnerability means to let go of your hard shell, to be like the octopus, to stay soft, to adapt, evolve, adapt, evolve again. Vulnerability means to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I want to fix it. Help me learn. Vulnerability means to be able when it matters, even when there are no guarantees and there never are, to be able to say things like, I love you. I like you. I believe in us. I have hope for this world. Vulnerability means to have faith, even though you have considered all the facts. It means to be alive, to be fully alive, even when it hurts, especially when it hurts. So today, this month, I invite you to maybe be a little bit more vulnerable in your life. And if you want, you could even tell me about it, and I promise to listen to you with my whole heart. I love you. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join in our closing hymn for all that is our life, number 128 in the Gray Hymnal.
you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, choir. Please remain standing, if you will, and join me in our chalice extinguishing words, which will be here in just a second. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please be seated. Our worship service has ended. After a lovely postlude from Tom, I invite you to join us in Parish Hall for some refreshments. Folks on Zoom can now click to join a breakout room and have a short conversation. If anybody would like to talk with me about the worship today or about any old thing, I will be in the parlor. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Happy Sunday. <laughs>